so it has come to this. Good men, torn from their kin, to rage and spill the blood of other men's foes. But we will not be forgotten. names will inspire the mighty to rise. Welcome to a Total War Saga Troy. This is a Creative Assembly's latest title, which is a take on the uh, Homerian uh, saga of the Iliad. And uh, before we begin, I should mention a couple of things. Uh, first of all, it's been a while since I've actually made content on the channel. Uh, thank you for your patience and so forth. Uh, this summer has been uh, interesting. But more on that in another video. Um, so, this game is, of course, as you expect, a Total War game with all of the... Uh, uh, implications that has. Uh, it does have uh, some fairly interesting new mechanics and uh, I've tried the game for... Uh, we played a... see here? Played 21 turns so far and uh, I'm quite enjoying it. Uh, the, uh, the game is quite challenging of course but part of that might also be because I'm not used to the systems that are being used in this game compared to the previous titles. Now, for those of you who uh, are not familiar with Troy, uh, the um, I'm sure everyone is familiar with the Trojan Horse. I'm not sure if that actually is a f something that's featured in the game or not. It would be fun if it is. But the game is focusing on the historical flashpoint of the Trojan War, uh, where you can either play as one of the Greek uh, factions, or you can play as one of the Trojan factions. So you can experience the conflict from either perspective, and they have also added the um, the uh, legendary and and heroic aspects of the uh, the story presented by uh, Homer. So you have mythical units as well as the uh, iconic heroes, and uh, it's, it's kind of. A balance between fantasy and uh, and reality in that sense and um, as I'm sure some will be most displeased by it is an epic games exclusive title but uh, if you go to the epic store uh, on launch day which is August the 13th it is actually free for the first 24 hours so if you go there and claim the game within the first 24 hours after the game is launched, it is yours. Which is a heck of a great deal, if you ask me. So, let's go and have a look at the uh, various uh, factions that we can play here. Uh, let's do a new. So you have the Danans, uh, which are the Greek uh, factions, where you have, of course, King Agamemnon. Um, which is the recommended start, uh, the faction of Mycenae. If you um, 
play the Greeks. But of course, you also have Achilles. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Phthia? Phthia? Phthia. We'll go with that. Uh, you have Odysseus of Ithaca, and of course Menelaus, who's kind of integral to the story of Sparta. On the Trojan side, we do have uh, Hector, the Prince of Troy, and uh, his uh, younger brother, Paris. Uh, we have Aeneas, the Lord of Dardania, and we have Sarpedon, the King of Lycia. We also have King Priam, but uh, King Priam is the uh, the mother faction that kind of unifies the Trojan factions. Now I'm playing, I'm planning on playing as Sarpedon of Lycia. Um, he starts down here on the map. Um, but let's just have a quick look at the at the eight major factions. There will be a, a DLC where you can actually play as the Amazon faction as well, which I believe is allied with the Trojans. But let's start with Agamemnon. As Agamemnon... Will cross me and live. Sorry about that. Uh, Agamemnon starts here, in uh, the uh, southern part of uh, Greece, in Mycenae. Uh, we can also uh, play as Achilles. I burn the brightest. He starts up here. Odysseus. My journey is long. Starts on the uh, backside of uh, Greece here. And Menelaus on Sparta. Will shake the world. Now, as you can see on the right-hand side here, each of the uh, factions have uh, various uh, skills and uh, traits that are unique to them, and they also have a recommended playstyle. Sparta, uh, obviously, and uh, not surprisingly, have a heavy focus on heavily armored infantry. They also have slingers for preemptive strikes. Now the game has uh, four types of heroes, um, or four main class of heroes, which have some sub archetypes. And Sparta doesn't get access to the archer uh, heroes. Odysseus. Silver-tongued Odysseus. They have a roster that is focused on stealthy, fast-moving units, um, ambushers, and guerrilla stalkers, actually. They don't have access to the Defender class hero. We'll get into these uh, when we actually get into the game. Agamemnon. Only the strongest survive. He doesn't have access to the fighter champion. Um, he has the most balanced uh, roster among the Achaeans with a good mix of all of the things, uh, actually. And these are the unique faction units, Agamemnon's guards, Agamemnon's companions, and light javelin men. And then Achilles. War is my life. Doesn't have access to the warlords. Uh, focused on great speed and maneuverability, as well as versatility in battle. It has the largest number of faction unique units. Uh, they have the Thessalian, Thessalian marines, the Aeginian Runners, the Pelagic Thessalians, the Myrmidon Swordsmen, whom actually I thought belonged to Sparta. And they have Spear Fighting Myrmidons and Aeginian Javelin Men. But enough about the Greeks. Uh, there should already be plenty of playthroughs on YouTube uh, featuring the Greek factions. So let's go I'll to the Trojans. This fight. Hector, the heir of Troy. Um, focused on tough, heavy, and expensive, well-armed units. Uh, doesn't have access to the archer hero. Hector's chosen, the champions of Troy, and the guards of Troy. All heavily uh, armored infantry units. Paris. A lover, not a fighter. Who would probably be my preferred hero, but with a starting situation that is hard, I don't think that we're going to play as Paris, but one thing that I've learned from countless of hours in Total War Warhammer 2 is that uh, ranged units are usually the king when it comes to, uh, to Total War games, and this is definitely true for, uh, for this game as well. And uh, Paris's roster is focused on ranged superiority in battle. 
Um, brings in some of the best archers combined with good defensive line and some quick axe units. So he has the Champions of Troy as well, but in addition he has Trojan Noble Chariots, which is a skirmisher bow chariot unit. He has the Trojan Princess, which is a, a bow infantry unit, which isn't really that bad in, in uh, close-up uh, melee either. And then the regular Trojan Nobles, uh, also not half bad in, in, uh, in melee, but... Um, of course, compared to, to these guys, with a melee attack of 42 and a melee defense of 64, uh, 40 and 32 and 29 and 18 isn't much to, to say uh, huzzah about. Now, he doesn't have access to the uh, Warlord hero class. Aeneas. The gods have plans for me. His roster is infantry-based, with a big variety of decent cheap light units, uh, which can be used in human wave attacks before the heavy infantry engage the battle. Doesn't have access to the defender hero class. And uh, his units... Dardanian rabble. Okay. Uh, these guys are obviously expendable. Um, fearless swordsmen, Dardanian chargers, Dardanian defenders, and Dardanian mob, another expendable unit. Interesting, um, interesting uh, units there. Uh, and finally, Sarpedon. True to my promise. Combines fast, light troops armed with armor-piercing weapons and extremely mobile chariots used for flanking support. And doesn't have access to the fighter champion. So the unique units are the Companions of Sarpedon, the Lycian Champions, and the Lycian Winged Chariots, which you actually begin with at the beginning of the game. Now one thing that I didn't remember to mention here is the fact that all of these factions have different faction playstyles. Uh, but I don't think we're going to go through all of those. Uh, really, uh, there's a lot of things that I would have to go through uh, for each faction. Uh, but I'll mention how Sarpedon plays. Uh, Sarpedon has precious resources, and uh, that means that we have access to Celestial Iron, Minoan Relics, and White Granite. And instead of actually going into these things here, let's just see how they play out in the actual game. So, with all that... Uh, chattering uh, done. Let's go into the game. And yes, I'm going to play on easy easy. I will have 60 minutes uh, enabled. I'm using incremental autosaves just in case we need to revert something. Uh, I don't feel confident enough about the game that I can't promise that we might have to reload some saves here. Anyways, prove your honor. Are we mere playthings of the gods? Or do we plead divine influence to justify our foolish choices? He's taken her! He's taken my wife! You've risked the safety of Troy. Troy is my home now. You have my oath, brother. She will be returned to you. Brother, I can fight! Go. Seek shelter. There'll be plenty of fighting ahead. The wrath of Achaea will descend upon Troy. Paris acted in love. But he has incited war. Whether the walls of Ilios will endure, only the gods can tell. Now, um, Paris did kidnap. Um... Ah, divine Sarpedon. Oh. Long ago, your people were banished from rich and beautiful Crete by the forefathers of Menelaus. The coming war between the Achaeans and the Trojans could present a long-awaited opportunity to retake the island. 
My experience and wisdom may serve Troy well. Lycia is Troy's ally. You shared a common destiny with King Priam. To the north are the ruins of settlements destroyed by raiding tribes. These can be recolonized. To the east lie the lands of the Leleges. These tribes wage war on the coastal Ionians. Across the sea, on rich and beautiful roads, the Achaeans have established prosperous settlements. From these, they hope to keep you at bay. On the mainland to the north are their Achaean allies. They represent a chance for trade and possibly conquest. Further north are your kin, the Carians. They can be trusted in times of need. Become familiar with your interests, your friends, and your enemies. Make them all work for you. Sorry about the noise there. I thought the microphone was muted, but it wasn't. Okay, so here we are. How they play. Lycia. Uh, precious resources, the people of Lycia value greatly items that hold little meaning to most other mortals. In times of need, a Sarpedon can acquire these and use them to boost the productivity and affluence of his subjects. And then we have the Lycian trade missions. Sarpedon of Lycia is eager to extend his tribal influence over foreign territories, for in this way he can convince traders to send their caravans to lofty Lycia instead of other destinations. The caravans may then bring him precious resources discovered in their homelands. And we get our first mission, which is to defeat an army belonging to the following faction in battle, Rhodes. And we'll get some food and some bronze in, bronze in reward for that. Okay, well, now, so, one of the major differences that they've made to uh, the uh, mechanics of uh, this game compared to uh, to uh, the previous Total War titles is the resources that you can see up there. Now, just need to set up the camera settings. Uh, as you can see up in the corner, uh, there are uh, five resources available for us to see. And uh, the first one of those are food. Uh, food is used in uh, recruiting uh, units and uh, certain buildings, and uh, I also think that it affects growth in your provinces. The second one is wood. Um, wood is the basic resource that we uh, use to construct buildings. We have stone, which is required to construct advanced buildings. We have bronze, which is, uh, well, Surprisingly enough, uh, required to equip and support advanced units. This is, after all, the Bronze Age. And then finally we have gold, which is the rarest resource required to construct special buildings or to train and support the best troops. These gold mine settlements that is mentioned in the tooltip there, uh, there are certain settlements that does provide gold. Uh, and as you can see in the tooltip, uh, the deposit w will run out eventually and then provide only 10% of its production. I believe there is a gold settlement somewhere in our close vicinity over here, but we'll get around to that eventually. I've uh, found that uh, the game, as Total War games often do, um, following the obvious path that the game lays out for you, which in this case would be to go after roads, isn't necessarily the best or easiest way to go about things. Particularly not since this faction here, the Kaunas or the Triopian, they are allied to roads. So while we already are at war with roads uh, and they wouldn't get involved right away, it is a very high likelihood that if we start invading roads, they would probably use diplomacy to convince these guys to go to war with us, and then we would be in kind of a conundrum with our army out on roads, and uh, 
Well, we don't have enough food to support more than one army for quite some time. So, first of all, let's just have a look at our hero here. This is the upkeep of the army. As you can see, we do need food to uh, maintain a standing army. And in addition, since we have uh, an elite unit in here, a uh, Lycian winged chariot unit here, we also need uh, bronze to support this army. But, first of all, let's do what the game suggests that we should do, which is defeat this enemy army. Uh, we really don't want a Rhodian army on our home territory anyways. Divine support in this battle. We currently have no gods on our side. We'll get back to that mechanic as well. So let's just fight this battle. Weather conditions are back. And uh, you have uh, three chances under most circumstances. Ambushes are different, of course, to uh, decide whether or not you want to deploy. We'll go with dry weather because I, I do like that. Okay, so the enemy army is over there. I don't think we want to fight down in this pass, so I think that we'll deploy up here. Now, there are various ways and various... Um, uh, methods that people subscribe to when it comes to formations. Some like to put the uh, ranged units out front. Uh, I'm not a big fan of that, so I, I like to put them in the behind. These Anatolian youths, they have a poor attack. Um, they are shielded, so they can deal with uh, incoming um, missiles. As you can see, they have a 35% chance, or they block 35% of all missile fire, hitting it from the front when they have shields. These Lycian Axe Warriors, we want to put them uh, somewhat to the side. And we'll have the Slingers here. Let's move this unit a little bit to the left, so that we can have Sarpedon in the middle here. Now the chariots will uh, put them into a group, control group, and we'll put them here because we want them to uh, flank the uh, the enemy army. And I believe that that should be it. Um, if you're wondering how to have that card open, you press I. That is one of that is the default default button, uh, and it will show you the uh, the uh, stats of the most recent. Uh, or the, the unit you're hovering over, whether it's down here, or the selected unit, if you have a unit selected. Start battle. Now, we're the attackers, so these probably won't bother moving too much towards us. I'm suspecting that they're just grouping up. Let's move these guys here. Speed things up a little bit. So he does have one missile unit in form of these skirmishers, but the rest, I believe, are non-missile units. Indeed, they are. Let's uh, harass these light swordsmen, some swordsmen a bit. I should also say that this is one of the best soundtracks that I've ever heard in a Total War game. I really enjoy the soundtrack in this game. Both the combat music and the uh, campaign over map uh, music is extremely uh, nice. At least to my ears. Okay, so they're attacking here. Let's uh, put our slingers uh, into action by uh, slinging projectiles at these skirmishers. Sarpedon can go attack Cleodorus, and we will send our units in. And as you can see, our chariots over here are keeping these uh, light swordsmen quite busy. Uh, 
Let's go out to the side and flank them. And then, of course, we attack from behind. Uh, the topmost bar is their uh, is health. Attack. Then you have the morale. You have their stamina. And ammunition for units that have that. Uh, vehicle health is also relevant for units that are vehicles. Although it doesn't show. Funkily enough. Let's uh, see if uh, we can't use the Dread of Ares on uh, Cleodorus. These guys are running away. Good. So are those. So let's have the Axe Warriors come down here. They are not broken yet, they're just running. So we want to make sure that they're broken. Those are broken. Or shattered, as I believe it's called. Which means that we don't need to uh, follow them anymore. Okay, now let's uh, charge our chariot through these units. They are shielded, but... Uh, having huge chariots run through you uh, doesn't really help with the shield. Victory! Is close enough to taste. As you can see, that really uh, took a toll on their uh, morale. And we turn around and do the same the other way. And they should be running away fairly shortly. Yeah, there we go. Now we can just harass them. These guys are still fighting. Uh, there is something called Aristeia, which is the greatest exploit for a hero, which would enable this, but I've actually never experienced filling that up. So we've won the battle, and I don't think there's any reason to chase down the units here, because I think this army is going to be uh, eradicated uh, after the battle anyways. So, end battle, decisive victory. And now comes a very uh, funky animation, which I do enjoy. That animation also comes when you auto-resolve some battles, which is nice. As per usual, we can either uh, grab something, uh, in this case food, or we can uh, execute the... Uh, survivors, which would in this case give us plus 8% morale uh, for two turns, or we can replenish our units. 17% replenishment is quite good, so I think we'll go with that. Take them on. And the army was indeed uh, eradicated. Good. That gave us 250 food and 80 bronze, which is excellent. New mission, muster the troops. We are to maintain 12 units in total, and we currently have six in our army. They will sing of this triumph. Yes, they will. Battle of Telmesos. We gained an ancillary, that's nice. A Kayan Clamis. Uh, this lightweight cape is ideal for avoiding sunburn in the punishing daytime heat. Enabling daily life to continue relatively unhindered by the climate. Plus two to happiness in the local province. Oh, that's quite useful. Cleodoros has perished in battle in Telmesos. Okay, so we gained a rank. And uh, I am actually quite happy with this uh, level up system because it... I do enjoy the level-up system in, in most of the Total War uh, games that does have it. In particular, I do like the level-up system in Total War Warhammer and Total War Warhammer 2. Um, but for a game like this, this actually makes sense to have a, a simple level-up system. Uh, so you pick one of the two, and if I wanted to, I could just skip 
uh, picking one of these and just save the, the skill point that I have. And then I would have two skill points when I reach level 3. So you unlock up to level 14, you unlock uh, one of these rows. And each of these have, as mentioned, one main skill on each side. And then two or sometimes one, uh, I guess we could call it a specialization kind of uh, skill. Which further improves the uh, the uh, basic skill that you have here. Here you have one with uh, just one specialization skill. And there's another one. And here is one. I have never seen any with three, so I assume that it is either one or two. On this side we have the immovable force, uh, which affects all allies in range, giving them 25 armor, but reduces their speed by 60%. Now that is a very useful skill. On the other side we have seize the moment, which affects all enemies in range by halving their melee defense. And the duration of this one is 40 seconds, while on the other side it's 50 seconds. Specialization here also reduces their armor, or we can reduce their weapon damage. On this side we can... Uh, the... Ah, it increases the effect range from 40 to 60 meters, or it can give them defense against charges by 200%, which is also quite nice. I think we'll go with the Seize the Moment ability here. Uh, reducing enemies melee defense, especially since you would often want your general to go attack, or rather your hero, to go attack the other hero. And then reducing said other hero's uh, melee defense by 50%. Uh, maybe even their armor and or, or their uh, weapon damage. Is, that seems more than just a little bit useful for me. So let's pick that one. Now in the equipment we have Sarpedon's armor, which is unique, his personal armor. And then we got the Achaean Clamis here. But this guy is an epic hero, of course. He overcame the enemy. Research is called Royal Decrees, somewhat like Total War Three Kingdoms, with its... Uh, system of, I, I don't remember exactly what it was called there, uh, reforms it was, I think it was reforms, yes, with a, with a beautiful tree. So there are uh, five uh, categories of research, or rather royal decrees, and instead of research efficiency they just call it administration efficiency. Uh, we start with royal bronze uh, and treasure hall, and in this tree you get um, some bonuses to agents and heroes. Oh, we also get Aristea and morale. And the other hand here, you get uh, recruitment cost and melee defense, or bonuses to me to medium infantry, basically, and also more bronze. In the treasure hall, which gives you gold per turn, on the one side you get uh, speed and campaign movement, uh, also some diplomatic relations bonus, that's not bad. Uh, attrition reduction and more loot after battles. On the other side you get recruitment, melee defense for heavy infantry and armor to all units. That's also quite good. But of course some of these technologies have a price. So 4,000 food for instance, That's uh, it isn't really that difficult to collect but um, yeah. There is a Trojan horse up here. And there you go. Unlocks a Trojan horse siege tower. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, this is the food uh, tree, royal granaries. Uh, on the one side you get faction growth and construction cost reduction and more food. Also construction, construction time reduction. On the other side you get recruitment cost uh, or bonuses to light infantry basically. Uh, this one is very good. 10% upkeep cost of all units and also cash the replenishment rate even if it's just four percent that is also quite nice and then we have the wood tree uh, on one side here you get construction cost reductions and construction time reductions this is for military buildings i think the other one was it yeah this and um, this one is for production buildings so but you also get more wood per turn, and you get that 
tasty uh, Trojan Horse Siege Tower. On the other side here, you get uh, recruitment cost, or rather, you get bonuses to missile units. So this one is uh, research that I would want to have fairly early, uh, or prioritize. Then finally, you have the Stone Tree, uh, which on one side gives happiness and uh, construction cost reductions, and also construction time reduction for temple buildings. Favor to... for all of the gods. Hmm. That's nice. So this affects uh, happiness and uh, divinity. On the other side you get influence, uh, which is a mechanic that I will also get back to. And reduction cost bonus to civil buildings, extra stone, and yeah. For now, I think that we will research the royal timber, which will give us 100 wood per turn, but it'll take 7 turns to finish this uh, decree. My father has smiled on us. Indeed. Okay, um... So, we have objectives. We can either do a Homeric victory, which would be to, I guess, follow the story of uh, the character that you are playing, in this case, uh, for Sarpedon, uh, we have to complete the 10 epic missions that we will get throughout the game. We need to make sure that Mycenae, or Mycenae, Sparta and Knossos have been destroyed or confederated. Of course, that also applies if other factions confederate them, as long as they are on our side, which is the Trojan side. But... In addition to that, we need to have 50 of each of the special trade uh, precious resources that only the Lycian faction has access to. Or you could go for the total war vic uh, victory, which is basically just occupy, race, or sack a hundred different settlements. Uh, we have to defeat our first antagonist faction, which I believe in this case is um, Rhodes. And then you have Troy, Mycenae, and Knossos, which has to be controlled through vassals or military allies. A great victory. Yeah, Rhodes. I had to double check. Diplomacy. They have added the, uh, and I'm very happy about that, they have added or, or they are reusing the a quick deal uh, mechanism that they introduced in Three Kingdoms. So basically you can click quick deal and for instance we can see what factions would be willing to sign a non-aggression uh, pact with us or rather how much uh, willingness they have towards uh, that. In contrast if we were to pick off a confederation uh, nobody would be very interested in this particularly not Troy. Uh, then again Troy has a strength rate ranking of 1. Well we are at 24. To confederate or vassalize someone, uh, you must uh, be stronger than them. Uh, military alliance, Dardania, Hector and Paris would be interested in signing that with us, but I'm not going to do that because at some point that drags us into a war with Greece and I would rather not, or Mycenae and the, uh, the uh, not the Ardanian factions, but the... Uh, well, the Greek factions. Let's just go with that. I don't want to be dragged into a war with them before I'm ready to be dragged into a war with them. Defensive alliances, they are still here. And military access, that's also still here. Um, but I... Let's see here. What faction is Tlawa? That's those guys. The Anthedian? Anthedius? They don't really like us. They are in a military axis with Triopian, which is our neighbors here. Uh, so we probably don't want to sign any treaty with them. The Perians, I don't think we want to sign any treaty with them either. Oh, they are at war with one another, aren't they? So basically none of the factions that are close by would be... Well, we do have a non-aggression pact with the Trojan factions. The reason why I'm looking at this is because it would be... The Koreans are up here somewhere. We do have a non-aggression. Okay, let's this see. This should it. be a good discussion. So we have a diplomatic treaty here that has a score of 
I'm looking at what they have. Uh, let's do a barter agreement and see if we can uh, convince them into uh, giving us wood each turn for the next five turns. Okay, so we can convince them to give us 100 wood over five turns and it would still be a favorable uh, treaty in their opinion. Wood is something we need. Uh, so let's go ahead and sign that. We all did well here. Indeed. So that's diplomacy. And then we have the divine will. So you have the uh, the pantheon of Olympus here. Uh, of course, they haven't added all of the gods, but uh, the names here should be familiar to the people who are familiar with the Greek mythology. So we have Hera. We have Zeus, we have Ares, we have Apollo, we have Athena, we have Poseidon, and we have Aphrodite. Each of these, of course, provides different bonuses. Um, and there are two different things you can do in this specific screen. Uh, you can either do a prayer or you can do a hecatomb. Uh, the hecatomb gives you a one-time favor. It's a ritual. Uh, so if I, for instance, were to do a hecatomb in favor of Hera, it would cost us 500 food and it would give us 70 favor with her. But we also have the favor decay. So each turn, the favor that we have with the gods currently uh, decays with 10. Since this is mentioned up here, I'm sure that there are things we can do to modify that later on. Now, I'm not going to go through what each of these gods do. Um, if you want to, you can always pause the video and have a look at the various bonuses for yourself. There should be ample time for that with the uh, mouse over that I'm doing. And as you can see on the left, uh, the respective levels are 50, 300 and 600 points of favor to get up on, on this. We are going to be focusing on Apollo because he provides bonuses to uh, missile units, uh, particularly archer units, and Ares, since he gives us some bonuses to sword and axe units, uh, but more importantly, he gives us plus one to local recruitment capacity faction-wide, which is something that I uh, do uh, enjoy. Aphrodite is always uh, a good... Um, Consideration, uh, if you can get up to celebrate it with Aphrodite, you get plus 30 to growth, uh, plus one happiness per non-aggression pact, up to five. Uh, and you also get plus 10% battle captives, but the plus 30 to growth and plus one to happiness, up to five, faction-wide, those are rather nice. Now, there is one thing that I would like to mention uh, with these. Uh, on the worshipped, that is 600, they give you access to mythic units. Uh, or rather some of them do. So Hera would, for instance, let us recruit a Corybantes. Uh, Zeus would give us a Minotaur. Aris would give us a recruitment of Spartoys. Um, Apollo would give us uh, a Seer, which, an, which is an epic agent. Athena would give us recruitment of a Gorgon. Poseidon would give us a Cyclops. I'm very disappointed that he wouldn't give us a Kraken, but that's just me and my tentacles. And Aphrodite would give us access to a Satyr. Now, uh, some of these are... Of this yes, yes. Some of these are epic agents. Uh, namely, the Gorgon, the Satyr, and the Seer. Uh, now, I can't really go into what all of these things do, uh, because we're already at 44 minutes. Uh, so I think that we'll go into these when they become relevant. For now, let's uh, Sarpedon, move Sarpedon northwards because we want to colonize the ruins up here before we actually go into any kind of wars. Of let's move him up. Uh, I believe that's the road there. So let's move Advancing. him there. We want another unit of Lycian winged chariots. And I believe we could... We the enemy. Uh, let's have a look at the buildings here. We can build a training rounds, which would give us access to Eastern Spearmen and Heavy Axe Warriors. 
these guys no nope, they don't require bronze well, that's good um what we want to get built as quickly as possible is the uh, the practice range so that we can get access to uh hunters which are our archer units of course um no we don't have any uh, wood okay let's just recruit uh two units of light skirmishes then And the final thing that I will uh, mention is that it doesn't really get reflected very well on the first turn, but the turn times when you click end turn has been so improved that I am actually uh, nearly almost a bit shocked at how well that has been improved. So let's click and turn. And again, it isn't really reflected on the first turn, but it actually gets quicker and quicker uh, great later on, which is not what you'd expect. <laughs> yeah, the, the, that's the speed that you can expect uh, later on. So we have a new mission to uh, issue a royal decree, um, which will be done in six turns. But on that note, I think that uh, we can end the episode here, and uh, I hope that you enjoyed the episode. I will be releasing several episodes today, so that uh, you can binge watch if you want to. But for now, thank you all so much for joining me, and I will see you all in the next episode.